Hi, and welcome to the next installment of the Wise Women Educational Series. I'm Augustine Colbrook, and I'm so happy to welcome you um, to these uh, roundtables across the country and around the world about midwifery. So if you're just joining us, go ahead and say where you are tuning in from. Um, I, uh, I personally am actually in uh, Westport Harbor. We just sailed this morning from Newport Harbor up to Westport Harbor. So um, one minute ago, we grabbed the mooring. We were in big swells off the coast just a little bit ago. So um, really awesome that we're here and grounded and stable. So I just want to say a big welcome and thanks for joining me today. And if you're just joining now, go ahead and say where you're tuning in from. I love to see where in the world we're seeing people. And um, of course, as always, I have a big invitation to anyone who's tuning in and enjoy these free series. If there's any topic you'd really love me to present on, please tell me because, um, you know, I'd love to do the topics you want to know. So let's see, we've got a nice crew joining us today. Hey guys, good to see ya. So it looks like Mount Easton, Ohio, St. George, Utah, Austin, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Michigan, Madison, Wisconsin, Central Florida. Hey guys, welcome, I'm so glad to see you all. And um, like always, this is a free uh, educational series that I offer um, once a month. And it not only happens here where you can join the conversation on Facebook Live, but then I also make it um, on my YouTube channel and then it will eventually end up on my website too. So um, if there's, again, any topic you particularly want to see presented, do let me know in the notes or the comments below. My personal assistant Jessica is on the line today, so she's going to capture any of those, um, any of that information. Uh, I'm sorry for background noise. I am on still on my parents' boat, and there is our emergency VHF line, and um, so and some talking between them, landing, and that sort of thing. So pardon the interruption. I'm a mobile midwife, but I'm so happy to see you all on the line. And it looks like we're gonna have a really nice number today. Remember, you can always hit the share button at the bottom of your screen to share that with friends or colleagues around the country that you think should tune in. And you can also share this on your own pages uh, for people that might want to join. Uh, so welcome, so happy to see you. Looks like we've got people tuning in from um, Central Florida and Tulsa, Oklahoma, Austin, Texas, Eugene, Oregon, Willits, California, Northeast Pennsylvania, Ferndale, Washington, and Hawaii. So welcome guys. I'm so happy to see you. So today's topic is going to be about suturing and specifically the supplies needed, the methods, and the, um, uh, the actual method of assessing and then repairing perennial lacerations postpartum. Uh, someone's asking how big is the boat? It's a 45 foot, 45 footer. Um, so uh, yeah, someone from Lahaina, Maui. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. And Redwood Valley, California. It's so great to see you all joining the call. So um, I would love to um, share today. Let me get my notes set up. I also am going to do live demo suture. If you if you went ahead and got suture equipment and um, something to practice suturing on, um, go ahead and get that set up for yourself as well. Um, and let's see. So the first thing I want to say is talk about supplies. So I put out some supplies today. It looks like we've Nashville, Tennessee too. Welcome. So glad to see you. <clears throat> so we have some supplies here that I was just going to turn my camera around so you can see what I'm seeing. Okay, so one of the things that you're gonna need to have is a suture kit. You can either make those yourself and sterilize those um, by putting your instruments in your sterilization bag. I always put non-sterile gauze behind it so that it won't poke through the package and we get some additional sterile gauze when needed. Of course, you can also purchase pre um, put together laceration trays. I know Precious Arrows and In His Hands have good ones. This is an example of one here. Um, and um, syringe 
and instruments and needles all come in this guy here. These are really low cost instruments. They're not fabulous quality, but they work just fine for one to 15 uh, uses. You can sterilize them um, in your own packaging after you use it. And this whole package, this whole laceration tray is about $9. So um, again, fine for single use and it also can be reused again. So somehow you're gonna have to have your sterile instruments. And it will consist of stitch scissors and I like the ones that have the little hook on the end so that they can capture your um, suture material. They also come, uh, you, you'll need to have some tissue forceps like such. Um, they can either be flat or pointed, doesn't much matter. And then you'll need to have your needle driver, uh, like say. Um, and again, some people talk about quality with instruments. Um, I have an example of a really fantastic quality um, German steel. Um, this one's about $90, and this particular instrument here is about $9. So there's a huge range in price. Um, I really encourage midwives not to purchase expensive uh, equipment. Number one, um, you never know when a well-meaning grandma is going to throw your instruments away at a birth or when your student's going to leave them soaking for four days and they end up rusted. So having potentially disposable equipment is fine. You're also going to need to have gauze. Again, uh, that should be sterile as well. You can make sterile packs of non-sterile gauze using your um, autoclave bags. Or, of course, you can buy, buy your 4x4s prepackaged. Uh, any way that you do that is fine. You're going to need to have uh, sterile gloves. You're going to need to have uh, a uh, syringe to inject your lidocaine. Um, I do actually really appreciate the control syringes, like this guy right here. Um, when you're trying to use a syringe that does not have a handle um, and your hands are gloved and slippery, it can be really hard to... Um, create the action and the function that you need. Um, you're also going to need um, a needle to draw up uh, the lidocaine and your lidocaine. I do recommend 2%. One of the main challenges with lidocaine, of course, is that we can create infiltration of the tissues and swelling, which makes the tissues inappropriately large so that when the swelling goes down, our stitches no longer hold. So when we use a more concentrated lidocaine, we're going to be able to use less liquid and have more effect. Remember, the toxic dose for lidocaine um, at 2% um, is 15 cc's per usage. So um, our little uh, syringes here are 10 cc's, and I personally can't remember a repair where I needed more than a syringe of lidocaine using the 2% uh, in years and years. So you shouldn't get close to that. Um, I personally, in terms of injecting the lidocaine, prefer these little filament needles. Um, they are a 27 gauge, one and a half inch length needle. And what's great about these is you can see that they're very mobile. And so the reason I love the control sin syringe and the filament needle is because they both help mitigate the risk of potentially injecting lidocaine into a blood vessel. And of course, this is the main risk with carrying lidocaine is that we could potentially um, cause an anaphylactic response. And anaphylaxis would come when we got the lidocaine actually in a blood vessel. So our filament needle, that will slip around actual vessels, and our control syringe, which helps us always check and make sure we're not in a vessel when we inject, are two ways that we mitigate that risk. And of course, everyone knows that we're also carrying epinephrine. That is the drug that would counteract an anaphylactic response. But remember, we only use epi for an anaphylactic response, not just an itchy allergy. So we also have uh, inst uh, our suture material. Um, so uh, I usually recommend uh, the 3-0. Um, and uh, 27 or 36 inch length is both fine. Um, I do like the cutting taper or just the taper tip. Um, and this particular one is a 26 millimeter half inch needle. And um, I tend to like them a little bigger. This is just what I happen to have on hand. Um, but a 33 millimeter needle is also really, uh, gives you good control and good reach. Um, sometimes you'll want uh, a 4-0 um, 26 millimeter needle. And this would be for your real small closures um, like labial um, or perennial skin repair closures. 
So once you start suturing um, a, a good amount, you're going to also want to always carry some tenaculum or alligator forceps so that if you had a cervical laceration that you needed to repair rapidly, you would be able to pull the cervix down, visualize it, and repair it. And so the way you do that is you'll need two because you'd need to grab both sides of the tear, and then you would approximate them close to themselves, and then you'll need a long needle driver so that down the length, um, deeper than you normally do, you can repair um, in that direction. I also do recommend some midwives use the, the cotton gauze as their tampon to stop bleeding over the site of repair. But I do love this um, brand, it's called Instead. And um, this is a menstrual product, but we're gonna use it postpartum. Um, and basically you fold it in half and insert it above the wound um, so that you can occlude any bleeding coming over the source um, over the from the from the womb obviously we want to make sure we have good control of her postpartum bleeding and don't have a hemorrhage going on before we do that additionally I also recommend that midwives carry these disposable um, speculums with them um, to home births because there are times when we need to also have um, good visualization and because of really squishy mamas or because of an extensive tear sometimes we can't see everything and so we actually dismantle this uh, plastic speculum face them either direction and then your assistant can help to um, hold the vaginal um, walls open so that you can visualize what is beneath um, okay so let's see uh, I got a few questions I'm gonna catch up on um, Deanna is asking did you realize that you can oh, oh do you know that I didn't realize you could sterilize gauze yes indeed you can sterilize gauze um, we have a senior midwife student joining us from Bellevue, Florida. Welcome. Um, let's see. Uh, Brandy's asking for a, a, a video on IVs. Certainly, Brandy, we can do that next month. Um, uh, Margo, I'm not sure if there are any videos of suturing a cervical tear. Um, and yes, of course, you can use a vaginal retractor, but those are about $15. And this dollar, uh, dollar twenty-five uh, plastic speculum works exactly the same way. So I, I love to recommend that. So, so to the, all of those of you just joining, uh, welcome again. I'm so happy to have you here with us. Um, let us know where you're you're joining from. We're just going through equipment and talking about suturing um, equipment. I did want to let you all know that if uh, you have a mom who has some cane allergies, um, uh, carbocane can be the most safe um, analgesic uh, as opposed to lidocaine. So, so carbocane is our, our alternative um, if we are, uh, are have moms who are being sensitive. We've got someone here from Kodiak, Alaska and Seattle. Welcome ladies, so glad you could join us on the call. Uh, so lastly, um, I do want to recommend everyone have these angled bed pans. This can be absolutely invalid when you have a mom who you're suturing on a squishy bed. So I turn it upside down, I wrap the chucks around it shiny side up, and then shove that under the chucks that she's laying on. And then we have a flat um, regulated surface for her so we can do our repair without challenge. Okay, someone here from Kentucky. Hi, welcome. I'm really glad you're joining me today. Alrighty, so let's talk a little bit about um, assessment. So um, when assessing a tear, um, we need to have a good understanding of what the normal vaginal and perennial tissues and anatomy and physiology look like. So for those of you that are new to this, spend some time um, checking out. So when you do a vaginal exam, just visualize a little bit before you actually do the exam. If you have a friend or a midwifery student who you're able to um, spend some time with, really get good at visualizing what is what and where does it go. Certainly you have yourself you could look at, but really understanding what we're putting back together um, so that we can understand what is actually injured and um, how to assess that. But let's go through the international uh, standards for classification of a perennial tear. So we have a, um, a, a category one, uh, a type one tear, and this involves the vaginal mucosa, the perennial floor, and the, um, sometimes the, um, the vaginal wall. And this does not involve muscle, and it is very um, superficial. So we're, it's really important, sometimes midwives, especially new midwives, will look at a tear and think, oh, it's just so bad because it looks so different than it does normal. But we have to remember the length, the normal length of a perineum, um, 
in a non-pregnant woman and then and then compare that to the length of a crowning baby's perineum and the difference is can sometimes be as much as four inches so if you're seeing a very um, what looks like a very intense tear just remember that um, it's going to shrink considerably after the swelling of birth goes down so so keep that in mind whenever you're assessing tears but a first degree tear involves the vaginal mucosa the perennial um, body and um, sometimes the vaginal wall and skin of the perineum it does not involve muscle some midwives say that it's hard to tell the difference between um, a first degree and a second degree tear and a second degree tear is all of that plus um, the actual um, muscle of the perennial body and there are two main muscles that run across the perennial um, body and you can't really tell which is torn and to be honest with you in some tears you can't even tell the difference between muscle and deep perennial um, floor and and to be perfectly honest that doesn't matter and I'm going to talk about why in a minute um, but midwives do suture first and second degree tears we should be um, prepared to and we should know how to and that's what this video is all about um, a third and a fourth degree tear, we're gonna talk about those in a minute, are outside midwife scope. Although I will say that perennial skin that has torn over the anus, we can suture as long as it doesn't involve any of the actual anal sphincter or anal capsule. So a third degree tear is also broken up into three categories, a 3A, 3B, and 3C. A 3A is less than 50% of the anal sphincter, a 3B is more than 50%, and a 3C is all of the anal sphincter. And then a fourth degree also means that the bowel is torn. Um, in my career uh, of um, 17, 18 years now, uh, over a thousand births, I can tell you that I have only seen a tear worse than second degree five times. So um, it seems really obvious to me that we midwives wouldn't see it enough and therefore wouldn't be able to keep our skills up enough to be effective at, at repairing tears that are that extensive. And truly, we want full function for the rest of our lives. So a surgeon with bright lights, antibiotics, and pain meds it really makes the most sense for those type of tears. Uh, but good, careful evaluation will help you determine who you take in and who you don't. Um, so I also want to talk to you um, a little bit um, about the reasons why we suture. So there are four basic reasons why we repair tears. And if one of these four reasons exists, we should not um, tell the mom it's her choice and we should not allow her to refuse repair. Um, I know this is strong language and can be potentially controversial, um, but I want to be really honest here and tell you that moms um, in their hormonal and emotional postpartum stage really do not have the wherewithal to understand fully what they're refusing when one of these four situations exists. So um, we must repair a tear um, if it is not hemostatic. So if her tear is bleeding, actively bleeding, um, we need to repair it. There's, this is not something she can refuse. You can't have a slow trickle out of a perennial artery and not deal with that. Um, we also need to recommend strongly uh, repair and uh, when, when it involves function. So if we don't have function um, of, of the tissues uh, in the condition they're in, then we must repair. Um, and that includes long-term function. So um, if you know that her sexual function is going to be affected without repairing this, um, then, then I think you need to recommend that strongly. Um, we also need to repair a tear if it involves muscle. Muscle is elastic. It will pull away from itself even if the tissue is touching. So muscle cannot be repaired with any of the alternative methods that have been developed over the years. Uh, super glue does not repair muscles or certainly any of the midwifery things like seaweed or honey or any of that. That does not work. We cannot offer that as a solution. Um, if, if you don't know how to repair muscle, then you should definitely be taking that mama in. So because muscle is elastic, it must actually be brought back together. Um, so, so definitely um, strongly recommend repair um, if muscle is involved. And then lastly, um, aesthetics. And this would be aesthetics that matter to the mother. So if she does not want to look the way she currently looks after this perennial damage, then we need to repair that as well. So those are the four reasons. If none of those exist, aesthetic, function, muscle, or hemostasis, if none of those four reasons 
options exist, then she can um, uh, refuse suturing or you can um, offer um, or even a lot of times with simple first degree tears, we can actually uh, recommend against it because numbing up the area and repeatedly putting the suture material through that area can actually cause more irritation than just staying in bed with her legs together for the first week or two. Um, so let's talk a little bit about suture method um, now and I'll also take a little pause to see if anyone has um, any questions and let's see if you're just tuning in now definitely let me know where you are tuning in from. So let's see, um, uh, yeah we got a lot of people joining us, thank you so much. Uh, Austin, Texas and Summer Shade, uh, Kentucky, welcome. Um, so Laura's asking, where do you get the filament needles? Um, any major um, supply uh, place should offer them. Again, it's a 27 gauge, one and a half inch needle. Um, it is a yellow bottom needle that comes separately from the syringe. Um, hi Lisa, good to see you. Um, and let's see. Brandy's asking, um, how do you feel about suture clips? Um, Brandy, I basically feel the same way. Suture clips are not dissolvable, so they can't be in where the muscle needs to be. So for, for a second degree tear that involves muscle, we need to bring that back together with suture material. Margo's asking, can you talk more about teaching students to identify first versus second degree tears? Um, yeah, Margo, um, it does just take a lot of seeing. Sometimes when you open up the tissue and use gauze to remove the, the bleeding and really visualize the torn um, wound, you're going to see um, very pink um, vaginal floor. And then if you look deeper, sometimes it's it's kind of a deep red or even a magenta that is the actual muscle. Uh, sometimes you just see a kind of a dimple on the wall and that is the muscle retracting. Sometimes you really can't tell it all. And again, I just wanna reiterate, it doesn't really matter. But if you can tell that she has a significant wound, um, not repairing it is going to affect her sexual function. So that's not a great idea. Um, great, we see someone from Louisiana, Durango, Colorado. Uh, thanks, I like my glasses too. Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, New Orleans, uh, Fort Murray, Alberta. Welcome, Canada. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, and um, yeah, I think this is making sense. So if you have any questions, go ahead and post them. I'm gonna try to keep up with them. So let's, um, yeah, we were gonna talk a little bit about method. So I wanna talk to you about knot tying and um, and the type of stitches that we do in midwifery. But first I wanna talk like the big overview, which is the method of repair. There are basically two methods of repair. One is called continuous and the other is called interrupted. And that's different than like a deep interrupted stitch, right? I'm talking about overall method. So the continuous suturing method adds the benefit that there are less knots and therefore less suture material that the body has to break down. The downside is that because it's essentially one stitch, right? We tie a knot, we sew all the way through, and then we tie one last knot. Because it's essentially one stitch all the way through, if she is um, active postpartum and does pop a stitch, she's actually potentially released the entire uh, repair. So um, again, the benefit is there's less suture material for her body to deal with. The downside is that if she's not um, very still in uh, uh, postpartum, then she potentially can um, eliminate or re you know, cause the stitches to all fall out. The interrupted method of suturing is more, um, it, it's easier for most students to figure out in the beginning because it's more talking about planes of repair instead of the wound, the three-dimensional wound in general. But the downside of a, of a interrupted repair is that we have more suture material, more knots. It can be more irritating to her body. But I would still use this technique on a mom with small children who you know is not going to follow your advice and stay in bed for the first um, week or so postpartum. So uh, there can be downside and benefit to both. Um, and I don't feel like there is a right way. We're just talking about um, all of the different methods that we could use. So um, 
when I actually start start practicing suturing, I'm going to walk you through some of these, but we're just kind of going over the words in general. And again, if you have any questions, let us know. And of course, let me know where you're tuning in from. Um, so uh, Margo's asking, can you explain how to use the soft cup? Yeah, the soft cup is by a brand called Instead. And I use this if we have to occlude a bleeding vessel. Like if the reason we're suturing is because the bleeding is coming from the vessel, then I would like to stop any potential bleeding from above so that I can truly visualize the wound. Um, so, you know, we all have those repairs where they're bleeding um, fairly uh, more than we'd like, but we can't stop suturing while we're dealing with the bleed. Um, and, and instead of shoving gauze and cotton up inside, this is an opportunity to do it more gently because the slippery um, plastic is more comfortable for women. And then, of course, you get an accurate blood volume estimation when you do remove it when you're done suturing. Um, and of course, someone is saying that we would talk about this prenatally and whenever possible, we're going to do true informed decision making with informed consent and reformed refusal with all moms. My point is just that we shouldn't offer informed refusal when um, we know that it's going to have lifetime effect or she's still bleeding actively. Um, those soft cups come in one size. Um, it's sold at CVS. Um, you can get it at Amazon. It's called Instead is the brand. Okay, so let's talk more specifically about knot tying and about the actual um, stitches that we're going to use. So welcome, if you're just joining us, go ahead and say where you're tuning in from. Um, Margo, no, I don't think it needs to be sterilized. It comes in a completely sealed, basically sterilized package. Um, so, you know, the gauze that's sitting on our... Um, suture table also isn't exactly sterile. So welcome. If you're just joining us, uh, tell me where you're tuning in from. And if you have any uh, questions, uh, let me know. Yeah, the insteads are disposable. Thanks. Okay. So there's basically um, three different ways to tie knots. You can tie them with an instrument or you can hand tie them. And when you hand tie them, you can either figure out how to tie them two-handed or one-handed. Really, there is no better way to do any of this. It really is just about your skill, your habit, what your hand tells you is the most normal for you. So there are some great YouTube videos about knot tying and instrument tying with hands and instruments. Pardon me. And I would say just practice. Um, and it doesn't even have to be suture material. You can use all manner of string or yarn and figure out what your body wants to do. Um, I would say there's really no up or downside to any of it. It's just what feels better for you. People will tell you, oh, this is the best way, but it's really got to find out what's best just for you. Um, and knots are essentially a square knot with a third um, anchoring knot. So um, we kind of do one direction, the other direction, and a third, or we do two one direction and one the other direction. Either way, this makes sense once you start doing it. Um, it's a square knot. So we only have uh, four basic uh, types of stitches, and, and I want to share those with you. Um, I'm, you have to pardon me. I'm not a fantastic drawer. Um, can I have a pen, please? Mom, can I have a pen? Um, sorry. I'll get it myself. <laughs> um, we essentially have four different types of stitches. One that, that is the most basic to understand is called a, um, just a deep interrupted. And a deep interrupted is essentially just a knot. That's all it is. It's a knot that you trim both ends. So I'm going to attempt to draw this. <laughs> so hang in there. Looks like we've got someone from San Antonio, Texas, Minnesota, Forest Grove, Oregon, Georgia, Minnesota. It's so great. I'm glad you guys are with us. It's really fun. So, um... Just gonna try to show you this. So a deep interrupted is essentially you take a bite with your needle and you go up and close off, okay? And then you're gonna trim both ends. That's a deep interrupted, that's all it is. It's one stitch, we trim both ends, that's, that's it. We can also do a stitch called running. And there's a lot of names for this. Um, this can be like a baseball or mattress. Um, some people call it softball, whatever you call it. It's basically the same thing. You take a bite with your, with your needle, you come around, you tie a knot, 
but then you only trim the small string. And so with the long string, you sew down and we take little bites each time we're creating a stitch, but we're not tying a knot, we're just creating a stitch, right? So this is called running locked, and we get to the end of that line, we're gonna tie off and trim both ends. Um, and essentially, um, uh, this just looks like it does on the top of the skin. Uh, we can also take a bite, tie off, trim the lower string, and then every time we take a bite, we pass it back under the string so that essentially we get all of the suture laying on one side. And this is called running locked. And so again, we would tie off at the very end. So just running means you're just running the stitch down the line. Running locked means you take a bite and then you pass the needle back through the loop. And it creates a little lock here, okay? And these are essentially the exact same stitch. The only difference is that this one is, here's one knot that anchors it and here's the other that anchors it. All of this is the one stitch essentially between them. With the running locked, this will anchor it, but then all of these little joints will also anchor it. Um, so that if we have a mom who's super active, if she actually pops one of these, the hope is that the rest of these would stay. And again, uh, we, this has less suture material, even though my drawing isn't quite to scale, but this has less suture material, less joint, so it's less places for the body to break down, um, and this has slightly more. Uh, but when in doubt, if we have active toddlers, I do definitely recommend this style. And then lastly, um, the only other type of, of, of uh, stitch that we use is called subcutaneous. And we would take an anchor stitch at the base of where we're suturing, trim the tail, and when the long end, we go up one side, and where that comes out, we go up the other side, and then where that comes out, we go up the other side, and so forth and so on, um, suturing until we get to the end and tie off. And so what happens before you tie off, this is the same stitch, I'm just showing you what happens, is you, you basically pull up on that end and it acts like a zipper. This whole area comes together and the stitches are all inside. So this happens in the subcutaneous area of the skin. Again, this is the same stitch, just in function and then at the end. So to review, we do deep interrupted, which is just a knot with both ends clipped. We do running, a knot that runs down the line of the injury and then closes. Running locked, where we lock at each stitch. And then subcutaneous, that happens all in the subcutaneous area of the skin. Um, so that is basically um, the, the overview. Um, I do uh, recommend that we give good informed consents. Uh, with our moms when we're talking to them about um, what we're going to do and why we're going to do this, going ha and having really good conversations both prenatally and after the uh, tear to help them understand what we're doing and why we're doing it um, is very important. And then, of course, having very kind touch and being as as gentle and careful as we can to those mamas who are already in pain and a little worried um, can be really important. A lot of people ask about lidocaine administration and I'm going to do a little demo uh, now. So while I'm getting settled with that, go ahead and let me know if you have any questions or any comments. Um, if, you, if I haven't covered anything you really want to know about. Um, Yeah, I'm ready for some help. So I have a lovely assistant here who's going to help hold the camera. Okay, 
So um, I'm going to actually put blood in my tear to make it more realistic because that is a part of this whole journey that we're in, isn't it? Figuring out how to do it in real life. So when you have a tear um, and it is actively bleeding, get real close for me, okay, Mom? Come hmm? in and get close for me so you can see my hand. So um, the first thing that we're going to do is obviously explain to mom what we're doing. Um, I'm going to, you're going to feel my touch and we kind of slide our hands down and then you're going to, with your non-dominant hand, go ahead and open up the vagina so that we can visualize the tear. Um, with some gauze, you're going to go ahead and blot that area. Again, if moms can't handle this at that moment, um, we can always switch to numbing. Uh, with lidocaine before we start the examination and I start with topical lidocaine but we're gonna go ahead and and you really want to get fully to the base um, if she has if she's very very small and you're having trouble visualizing you can always just use your finger um, and your finger will slip into the tear whereas it will stay above on vaginal floor um, and so when you feel it slip into the tear um, you'll know where to examine more thoroughly so if we're going to get her nice and numb, I typically have my student um, hold the lidocaine and then all of my instruments have been dropped onto my sterile field. So what I'm touching is all fine. And then my student will hold the lidocaine jar for me steady and um, you know I can draw up and then that stays not bloody and not not like what just happened but oh, that's why we do it that way so um, to get her numb I'm going to again remind her that I'm touching slide down and then open up to the tear to as as far back as I can and then I'm just gonna spray cool liquid over the top of that wound um, and then I kind of leave her be again and just and let her get used to um, that numbing if there's active bleeding we may need to blot again just to make sure that the lidocaine actually touches the tissues then, um, uh, when we've had that about five minutes, then I'm going to, again, um, uh, open, visualize the tear, and then I usually take my lidocaine, and I, I warn the mom, you're going to feel a poke and a burn, and then we do one quick burst, I draw back to make sure there's no flash in the chamber, and then I eject as I withdraw. And so, as far back as possible, as deep as possible, um, and so for the purposes of this camera, come on, come on in a little closer. So if we have a tear way back on the inside, we're going to inject as far deep and as, as far as possible, draw back and then inject. And then into the perennial floor and inject, and then into one wall and inject as we withdraw, into the other wall, inject as we withdraw. And then lastly, we're gonna inject right here into the perineum, making sure not to go into the rectum, but to numb around that skin. And so the, the mechanism is to actually inject as you withdraw your hand from that tear. So then we wait a few minutes, and then without warning her, I go ahead and touch the, the tear with my needle. If she says, ow, she obviously needs more time to numb or she needs more, more anesthetic. But most of the time, after you've taken you know, five minutes with just the topical lidocaine and then um, a few minutes with um, the injections, most of the time she is numb enough that she doesn't uh, feel that um, sensation. I have two purple packs of suture over there if you'd get that for me. Um, so if she keeps bleeding, obviously you're gonna need to switch um, gears to dealing with uh, a potential hemorrhage. But if she's not bleeding, um, then we can go ahead and um, uh, move ahead uh, with repair. So again, I said 3-0 and 4-0. Um, I always start a repair with 3-0. Um, it makes the most uh, sense uh, because we want a stronger um, uh, material to repair uh, deeper inside. Um, so if your suture material gets um, wonky and kind of... Um, sticky you can always run um, a length of uh, lube down that um, down that suture material now if it's a fairly deep tear um, you kind of have to almost do this blind but what you want to try to do is you want to try to do um, the first stitch above um, where the um, above where the tear starts because we want to potentially occlude any vessels that are deep um, in the vagina and so take it until there's just um, a tail and then we um, I, I like to do instrument ties um, and so then it's kind of like we slide that down to the end 
um, we side that knot down to the end. Um, and then whatever way you picked up the suture material, the last time you go the opposite way with the next needle. And so we slide that down to the end. Um, then we'll want to trim off that extra tail um, as far back as possible, but without potentially trimming your whole suture line. Um, so now we have our anchor stitch deep in the vagina at the apex of the tear. Um, and then we can just keep on sewing uh, down, uh, down that line of um, repair here. Um, and sometimes the needle is big enough to pick up uh, the uh, both sides of the tear and sometimes you can only pick up one side and then bring it out in the middle and then pick up the other side. Um, being careful to visualize your needle. Um, remember, don't hesitate to readjust uh, your needle driver if you're not seeing where you're going. Um, and so once we get into the meat of the tear, sometimes we can't really see all the way across the tear, so we have to take one side and then pick up the other side like this. A lot of new midwives are worried when they get started because they look at this tear and they just don't even know what to do with it. And I always say, just get started. Um, when, when you start stitching, uh, bringing one side to the other, oftentimes then you'll see what actually is still left to be repaired. And again, we take a bite of one side and then we'll take a nice bite of the other side. Um, and um, once you start to see the vaginal floor coming together, then you'll start to visualize the, the pocket below. It's kind of like suturing requires three dimensional thinking. We have to think about um, the tear in in the three dimensions, but we have to repair it in one dimension, one line at a time. So it's kind of a curious, curious way. Now it's really important that when you're uh, suturing the vaginal floor that you don't start to suture hymenal ring residue. So anywhere from one to five millimeters inside the introitus um, at the fourchette is the hymenal ring. And when we suture in front of that, we know it's gonna bother her when she wipes and when she toilets. So it's really important that we keep our stitches behind that. So once you sew up to the hymenal ring, you have two choices. You can tie off right here, and now you have repaired the vaginal floor, or you can drop the stitch down into the next plane of repair, and this is called continuous, this continuous suture method. Neither is better than the other. We talked about the different pros and cons. So if I wanted to stop sewing here, I would take another bite and leave a tail here and use that to tie off. If I wanted to do continuous, then I would take my needle and turn it downward, and right where it came out at this spot is where I would have it come out um, below. Now see we've dropped down to the next plane of repair. And the great thing about doing this is that we can kind of leave it a little bit loose so that we can keep doing, uh, keep, keep uh, doing our repair with a little more room. Now if you, um, if you're sewing, you're not quite sure what to do next. You can always have a feel, kind of feel, figure out where we're going. And I use the first digit, the first knuckle of your finger to kind of be our guide. So in the width or depth, in any direction of this first knuckle of your finger, if you can fit your finger there, it needs a repair. And that counts for anywhere along this. So all of this area, my finger is not admitted, that repair is done. Now I have the deep um, uh, muscular area of the perineum that does need repair. So now I've dropped down to the next plane of my repair. And remember, it's kind of like three-dimensional. So I've repaired this, now I have this inner space to repair, and then I can finish with the outer. So in this inner um, perennial space, uh, we want to suture in this direction. On the perennial plane, we suture in this direction, but uh, um, in this area, we're going to go this way. So now that my uh, needle has dropped down, I'm going to go ahead and let it grab the opposite side at the same exact plane. Um, and so this is kind of tricky, but you need to make sure that you enter and exit on the same plane. And if it ever doesn't, remember you can always just pull it back out and get better visualization. So now my needle has come out in the same plane um, and we'll bring that area together. Um, so again, I'm just gonna keep that suturing going, um, but I'm gonna turn it to figure eight. So all of figure eight means is that instead of biting here and then continuing on this side, now we have two points of contact, I'm gonna switch one. 
so that the points of contact come in the middle. So I still suture in one direction, but then I switch my needle and start on this direction so that when it turns it, now the point of pressure is in the center where the muscles will be brought together the easiest. So to change that, um, I'm gonna make it so that my needle driver bites in this direction this time. Um, and again, we wanna leave our stitches a little bit long so that we can do that and tighten at the end. So um, now my uh, needle comes out this direction and then you can see how it brings that stitch together really nicely. So now with it sort of approximate, I'm gonna feel there's nothing that can go in there so that doesn't need repair, but this area does in fact need one more stitch. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, do that continuous suture in that direction again. Um, so we went that way this time, we'll go this way this time. Um, so grabbing here, and we don't come out in the perineum, so back it up if you've come too far. We come out in the vaginal tissue still. And uh, this guy is not letting go, there we go. Um, and then we don't want to create a, a tie there, so always be mindful about how your stitches are coming together. And then I'm going to go ahead and grab the top as well, going in the opposite direction. Should be grabbing in this direction. Staying in that same kind of plane, and I have one more to grab on this side so that we're closing that whole inner space there. So now again, I have another option. Do I want to um, go ahead and continue suturing continuous, or do I want to um, tie off and start my uh, perennial uh, repair? And in my book, I like to stop at this point um, doing continuous, and I like to make the perennial subcutaneous stitch a separate uh, repair. So now I'm going to come up above and behind that hymenal ring tissue and just go ahead and tie off up here. Um, she won't feel this knot and it makes it nice and tight. So again, leaving a loop of that suture material, that's where I'm going to tie off um, up and above behind that hymenal ring. Someone asked what about pockets? Yeah, so you can always assess to see if you have pockets as you're going using that finger technique again. Um, seeing if, if what you've sutured will admit a pocket. So right now I have the vaginal wall, uh, the vaginal floor closed, so I'm going to feel down that. My finger does not admit amongst the stitches. And then I'm going to go ahead and check out here, and my finger does not admit anywhere except for this perennial skin, which is the last bit that I'm going to repair. Frequently, when I get to this point, um, I really want mom to be a little bit more flat, and that's what that... Um, angled bedpan I showed you is about. We use that at this point um, to finish uh, finish the repair, um, giving her a little more flat and elevated uh, look. So if I have enough suture material, I could keep suturing with the same, but frequently you need to get out a new uh, line of suture material to do the perennial suture. So I'm just gonna do that to let you know. So um, it is not appropriate to use interrupted or running stitch on the perineum because this is the area that she will wipe and sit on for the next six weeks. Um, so we want to hide the stitches and this is where we use the subcutaneous stitch. So starting at the apex of the tear down by the anus, you've got to make sure she's nice and numb. We're going to go ahead and do an anchor stitch. So we open up, open up the wound as much as possible. And on one side, just inside the skin, we're gonna get a nice bite, do an anchor stitch, bringing it down to just the tail visible um, and tying off and then um, finishing our tie off in that direction um, so that we get a nice anchor stitch there. And then because we won't have access to this, it's gonna be occluded, we're gonna go ahead and cut off the tail and then this is our subcutaneous stitch where we go back and forth. So I started on the right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring that across. Wherever that comes across is where I'm going to put the next stitch. Sometimes at this point we need to use um, our little tissue forceps to see how to guide the needle into the appropriate approximate space. Um, sometimes you can use your fingers, but remember we want to avoid a needle stick at all possible. 
Do you put my glasses on my head? Thank you. Thank you. So where this came out on this side, I'm going to approximate that on the other, and we have to change needle direction each time. So make sure your needle drivers have a nice um, angle there. And remember, she's numb, so even though it looks awkward, all of this touching um, will not hurt her. So we go ahead and measure with the um, material, and then run up the opposite side, being careful to come out right where you want to, like yay. And then we're going to change our needle direction. And then wherever this came out is where we're going to start on the other side again. And if you feel like you've lost your needle, just back up a little bit and get yourself oriented. Um, it doesn't hurt her at all. So then once we've come almost to the top, um, we're going to take our last stitch here on the opposing side running up just in that subcutaneous space and then this is what I was showing you sometimes it does pull out that's called friable tissue and if you're really shallow on a very shallow spot sometimes it does pull out like that um, so you just can do another grab again um, so then like I was showing you in the drawing this becomes your your zipper stitch see how it just pulls the tissues together very beautifully in the end there um, and so on this stitch, um, uh, on the perineum, then you'd want to use your fingers just to make sure that it does come back together and lay nicely like you expected it to. And it does. And then to close off this stitch, we would want to go up and behind the hymenal ring again, again to hide all those stitches so they're not going to bother her when she's suturing. So you've come out at the fourchette, so you just go ahead and take a nice bite at the perennial floor or the vaginal floor again. And then just keep sewing until you're up and behind. And this does the benefit, of course, of making sure that these, these knots, these stitches aren't going to be uncomfortable for her. And they also make it so that um, there's a little bit of like essentially double suturing right in this area because this is, of course, the most vulnerable for those young new moms. A question from the same person who asked about what about a pocket? If you found a pocket, would you undo the stitches and redo or what? Well, that's a great question. Um, probably you're not going to find a pocket that's under stitches. So it is important to kind of check as you go along. And if you if you find a pocket as you go along, just throw in a deeper interrupted. Just kind of close that pocket essentially. Um, but you do need to check when you're at the end. Um, so I'm at the end now. I've come up and I've sewed up and behind uh, the hymenal ring. I clipped my suture material. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the very back of this vaginal floor. I'm going to remove gauze or that instead if I placed it. And I'm going to run my finger down that vaginal floor tear. And I don't know if you can tell, but it is completely closed and beautiful. Um, and then I'm going to feel down my vaginal, my perennial floor, and I can't get my finger in anywhere, and the skin is, in fact, back together. At this point, because she's numb, we might also take a wall, look at the vaginal walls, make sure we miss no other tears. Um, but at that point, she, she would be uh, completely repaired. If I came along and my finger dropped into another tear, say, on the side, um, then I would just do my best to put a deep interrupted. If it doesn't involve muscle, if it doesn't involve function, if it's not an aesthetic issue, and if it's not bleeding, you can just leave those surface kind of um, tears alone because um, they're not going to bother anything. Now sometimes as you're suturing, um, you come to the end of repair and you realize that there's this like this hymenal ring um, kind of re uh, remnants and it, it forms like a tongue that kind of hangs out. Sometimes they're black and blue. They're very bruised. If they're thin like this is, um, just go ahead and take your stitch scissor and just amputate that guy because this is too small to reattach and it's probably necrotic at this point anyway, if, especially if it's black and blue. And it's just going to cause a flap to be uncomfortable um, in her sex life. So just remove that. If you have a big flap um, that has been disattached, sometimes this happens from labia. We have a labial tear that is hanging hanging down. Um, if it's pink, then it's still fed by blood and that would be, um, uh, that would potentially bleed if you amputate it. So you have a couple choices. You can see if you can reattach it or you can fill it with lidocaine and then tie off the base, kind of occlude the base and clip above that. She'll always have kind of a bump there, but at least she won't have that tongue. 
So that's kind of the end of that repair. I'm going to get cleaned up and then switch to um, being face on. Any questions while I'm getting settled? Anyone have a comment or a question? Okay, so um, I got to do a repair for you and with you guys. If you got to follow along and you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear it. And of course, um, any topics you want me to do into the future, any feedback. Um, I really love, love doing this with you all. So uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for all the hearts and the likes. I love that. Um, so again, um, I am Augustine and I work with Wise Women Consulting and we do national um, consulting work for businesses who are trying to expand or open both individual midwives and birth centers. Um, I have a graphics design artist on my team, a couple of assistants, I have a lawyer I'm on team with now, so we can pretty much answer any questions that you have. And um, I love to be a resource for midwives. I have stopped midwifing mamas because now I'm midwifing midwives. Um, so I really love my new career. And uh, we do site visits all around the country for birth centers or, or clinics starting up. And I'm available by Skype or um, phone in order to do uh, consults. And of course, um, I, I really love helping new midwives launch their practices. So uh, thanks again for tuning in today. Let's see, we have a few questions popping up. Um, and I appreciate that. So what degree would you say that repair was? I'm um, definitely a second degree tear, uh, not third. The anus would have been below where I had the, had the uh, specimen actually. So whether um, that was a really, really deep first degree or a second degree is kind of irrelevant at this point. It definitely needed repair. She would have long-term um, issue if that wasn't there. Um, yeah, so getting some thank yous. Appreciate that. I, um, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I like the realistic too. There's so often we're practicing with meat on a flat surface and that is not how vaginas are. So creating a tunnel out of your meat will help you get so much better. So Sally's asking about clitoral hood tears. Yeah, they can be really terrible. Um, I have some pictures of a repair uh, that I can post on this Facebook um, invitation just to give um, more visual of how that is repaired. But essentially we're gonna use a 4027 millimeter needle and just go really slowly uh, bringing skin back together uh, the best you can. Oh, Julie, thanks so much. I'm glad. Yeah, definitely watch uh, the recording. That will help you catch up. Um, thanks, Missy. Appreciate that. Rochelle, Liza, thanks. I am on a boat. Yes, I've been on my parents' boat. We just made the crossing from um, Newport, Rhode Island up to Westport, Massachusetts and got on a mooring for me to get close to cell reception in order to be able to do this. So um, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be a resource to the midwifery community. And aside from doing consulting and coaching for new midwives, I also do advanced practice midwifery workshops. And I have a couple coming up in Utah and in um, Wisconsin in August. So um, you can look that up on my um, consulting or education website. And it's wisewomeneducation.weebly.com. And um, again, I love to be in contact with new midwives. If I can be of help, let me know. So that's wisewomeneducation.weebly.com and of course my website, augustinecolebrook.com. Well, it's been a real pleasure to meet with you all today. We had a nice big full crew and this will be on my YouTube channel and my website. And do let us know if you have any other topics you'd like to see. Oh, and Jesse's reminding me, yes, we'll be in Austin, Texas in October. So um, thanks again and um, have a fabulous day, friends. Stay in touch. Be good. Do good work in the world. Thanks. Bye.